and we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's uh, final uh, event in our Decreasing Family Homelessness webinar series where we're going to be talking about the role of community action agencies in addressing uh, homelessness statewide. Um, so a little bit about the learning community, but really its uh, focus is to help you all do what you're doing just better and to be more informed about the issues um, in your areas. But really what we do is we highlight innovative anti-poverty practice models and we showcase them out to the network. Um, this is of critical importance because anti-poverty work lies at the center of what we do in community action. As we like to say here at the national office, it's the heart of who we are. Um, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce the rest of the LCRC team, but a little bit about us and the people who put on these webinar events. Um, we have Tiffany Marley, who is the project director, Joel Crocker, who is the director of our training and technical assistance department. Um, some of our newer staff members, we have Courtney Kohler, she's the senior associate for the TNTA department, uh, Liza Forrest, she is our program associate for TNTA. And of course, we have Charity Brinkowski. She's actually our AmeriCorps VISTA volunteer who's working on our overall impact project. So um, one of the things that we do in the learning community is facilitate the national webinar series. And again, this is just another venue for us to showcase those promising anti-poverty strategies and service delivery models out to the broader CSDG network. So specifically about this webinar series, uh, for the past two years we have been thrilled to host the series in partnership with the National Alliance to End Homelessness. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague uh, Sharon McDonald from NAEH in just a moment to talk a little bit more about the series, but I just wanted to remind you all that um, in addition to the previous seven webinar events that have been hosted, you can also find a plethora of resources and policy updates and guides uh, both on uh, the National Alliance's website, but also on the Learning Community blog. And if you go to the blog, you can actually enroll to follow to receive uh, live email updates whenever we post things relating to this topic on the blog. So we encourage you to do so if you're interested. Um, and as we like to do before we kick off all of our events, we recite the promise of community action together. We do this because it grounds us in our work and it reminds us why we're all here. And it states that community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community, and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over into the very capable hands of our presenter today, our moderator today, uh, Sharon, Sharon McDonald from the National Alliance and Homelessness. So Sharon, you're on. Um, and, and I also want to um, say thank you for the great partnership we, that we've had with the Community Action Partnership. And just to let you know that we've, um, you know, there's a number of different topics that we've hit over the course of the last uh, two years, including the webinar on the research on family homelessness and rapid rehousing on how to make the most effective use of your homelessness prevention resources so that you're, ta you're actually um, preventing homelessness, uh, ways that you can be integrated your Head Start programs with your homeless service court uh, programs in your jurisdiction. About 50% of the children who experience homelessness are age five or under. Um, and then, then over the last year, we've really started to focus in on uh, CAP agencies who were taking the lead in responding to homelessness, taking a look at Wisconsin, um, it, who wore two hats, uh, the Community Action Program um, uh, there, who's both the COC lead and a Community Action Agency uh, partnership in Salt Lake City, and just earlier this week, two community action agencies that were involved in a 100-day challenge to end unsheltered family homelessness in Washington State. So over the course of the last year, we've uh, or two years, the Alliance has tried to share what we think is the most important information about family homelessness um, and, and, and what we believe are the most promising practices and explored community action agencies that are really on the front line of doing this work. 
um, at the conclusion of this of, of the two presentations we're going to hear today, we would love to hear from you about what's next. We know that people in the audience, are, many of you in the audience, are on the front line of ending family homelessness or ending homelessness. We would like to see, for those of you who are not, what could we be doing that could help support your greater involvement. Um, so we want to have time reserved at the back end to really solicit from you what the alliance, what the community action partnership, what some of our federal partners, in, including the U.S. Interagency Council and the Homeless uh, or HUD or HHS could be doing. So there's greater coordination between uh, community service block grant funding and some of the kind of supportive services that are delivered there and the critical housing resources that are delivered through HUD so that we're providing a more holistic and comprehensive response to families and other people who experience homelessness. But just to kind of let you know that these are the resources that are still alive and available to you uh, on the Community Action Partnerships uh, website. So today we um, are going to have a glimpse of what I think is next and, and, and thinking where do we go from here, I think that what, where we need to go is where community action actions agencies are really involved in the big picture state level thinking about using their resources whether those are HUD resources under their control or um, or leveraging some of the supportive services that community action ha agencies have at their disposal, how are they involved in actually driving down uh, the number of people who are experiencing homelessness? So there are fully-fledged partners in this effort. It may not be the right role for every community action agency, but we think it's the right role for many. So that's um, so the two presenters that we're going to hear from today are both people who are doing that. So Kelly Forney is uh, with is the Family Outreach Director at the Central Nebraska Community Action Partnership. And in Nebraska, she is also uh, the head. Uh, their agency is also the lead agency for the HUD Balance of State Fund. So she's uh, an example of somebody who wears the two hats. Uh, so they're, they're managing, managing their continuum of care process. Our second speaker after Kelly is Stuart Campbell. He is the Director of the Office of Community service program in the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development. So after their two presentation, um, we're going to ask you, what do, where do we go next? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I appreciate that. Um, well, I'd just like to get started um, and tell everybody just a little bit of uh, information about Nebraska itself. Um, and the community action makeup of uh, within Nebraska. And we have nine community action agencies um, made up of three COCs, the Balance of State, uh, the Lincoln COC, and then the Omaha COC. There are a variety of regional uh, local COCs within individual communities. Um, when we first started out uh, moving towards ending uh, homelessness within the Balance of State, we had numerous meetings and we had some really great insight from people, but unfortunately it was always the same people making the same decisions, going to the same meetings, and we weren't getting a lot of um, uh, outside interest in, in doing those things. So that was one of the first things that we started looking at. Next slide, please. Um, just a little bit about my agency itself, um, we are in central Nebraska, we cover 21 counties depending on the program. Um, we have several different programs that might go outside the original 21, but our core agency uh, does cover those 21 counties out of 93 counties in Nebraska. We have three direct uh, service departments, um, housing, early childhood programs, and then the family outreach. My department is the family outreach department. And then we have community health programs, um, which includes WIC and immunizations. Um, a little bit about SSVF in Nebraska is my agency received the first SSV, excuse me, SSVF grant in uh, 2012, and it was a great success. In 2014, two of the other CAP agencies in Nebraska received their SSVF grants, and then there was another nonprofit in Omaha that received a grant. 
Um, so at that time, 46 of the 93 counties in Nebraska were covered um, by Nebraska agencies. The western and southwestern portion of the state was actually covered by another state, and then there were eight counties in the eastern portion of the state that weren't covered at all. Um, obviously, that made things very difficult in terms of moving towards ending veterans homelessness uh, in the balance of state, with not all the counties being covered and trying to work with another state um, posed a whole different set of issues, really. Um, they provided really good services, but they weren't involved in any of our COC meetings and none of our community planning meetings, and so it was, it was kind of a struggle. Um, then in 2015, the VA approached me um, and asked if I would apply for additional grant uh, to take over the coverage of western and southwestern Nebraska, and then two counties in eastern Nebraska. Then one of the other community action agencies was also granted uh, the coverage areas for six other counties in eastern Nebraska. So at this point, the entire state was uh, covered by SSVF program. This really afforded us the opportunity that we had never had, and so we started moving forward with um, ending veterans' homelessness. We developed our community planning meetings um, kind of from scratch, really. We hadn't done much with our gaps analysis tools and things like that, so we started doing those things. Um, we started meeting more often, having more uh, conference calls, and they went very well. And finally, in June of 2016, I was able to um, get the by name list implemented uh, with the assistance of our uh, HMIS administrators and the other CAP agencies. We were still very limited on the amount of people we had at the table, but it was definitely a start for us. Um, now we just needed to figure out who and where we needed to get the other folks involved. Next slide, please. Um, some things that we kind of ran up against um, with our new coverage areas was the rural nature of our coverage area. We had all worked in rural areas before, but we had never really experienced this kind of uh, issues um, and didn't realize how extreme some of those were. Um, for example, distance from travel from my main office to one of my satellite offices out in western Nebraska, it was a five-hour trip. and going out there you didn't have a lot of the the services like internet and telephone and things like that until you actually got out there so that in, in itself posed some issues um there weren't any shelters available um other than you know there were some uh db shelters but most of the shelters were in the populated areas um on the eastern part of the state so that gave homelessness um, a whole different look for us. Um, there weren't any uh, towns for miles and miles, so there wasn't, you weren't seeing the homeless population like you normally would in some of those towns. Um, we kind of joked around about, you know, we're trying to do street outreach, but in these areas it turned out to be more of a field outreach service. Um, there was abandoned houses and people were literally uh, sleeping in fields, um, sometimes in tents, sometimes not. And that's where we would have to go to, to locate our, our homeless uh, population. Um, weather also was a huge factor for us. Um, we were seeing that, you know, in our uh, uh, home office, it could be beautiful weather, it was fine, but out west, 12 inches of snow was getting dropped in a matter of hours. And so that always kind of posed a problem with us and with the homeless population, of obviously. Uh, next slide, please. The next thing that uh, we looked at was our community gaps that we got from our community assessment, uh, needs assessment. Um, we pretty much already knew what they were, um, but we looked at these to see who can we get at the table that um, were offering some of these services and we just didn't know about it, or who could possibly address some of these needs, and which ones specifically pertain to the veterans we were serving. Um, and I'm sure that, that a lot of these um, gaps are familiar with pretty much everybody. Um, 
but like I say, we wanted to look at it to see who can we get at the table. Um, housing obviously, safe affordable housing obviously is very um, difficult everywhere. Um, one of the things we noticed uh, specifically was the low wages and the jobs that were available were low uh, wage service jobs. So we knew that we definitely wanted to get um, landlords involved. We wanted to get workforce development involved. Um, we needed to get um, DHHS involved, um, the DV providers, police departments, housing authorities, all those people. And we met on several different occasions to determine who we're going to talk to and, and how we're going to get them on board. Next slide, please. One of the um, things that we noticed was we weren't different. We just hadn't worked together uh, collectively before. I can't speak descriptively of the other CAP agencies, but we found that we're all very similar in nature as to the programs that we had, and we just needed to have the push to start working together. Um, in retrospect, it seems like a very simple solution, but it was just one that had never been implemented um, until now in Nebraska. There were certain things that we might work on together, but as far as uh, balance of state or statewide um, ending homelessness, we had never done this. Um, my agency itself, uh, we always uh, we have several different uh, programs, as I've mentioned, um, 24 different programs to be exact, and my department offers 10 of those programs. So we try to offer a wraparound services um, so that we can identify all the um, needs in the community. We obviously do a lot of advocating and referring. Um, and a huge amount of linkages to the mainstream resources. We try to use as many of the community's uh, resources as possible. And as I said, we were finding, you know, obviously the other CAP agencies were doing the same thing, just not together. Um, next slide, please. So um, at this point, CENCAP was covering 62 of the 93 counties in Nebraska with the SSVF program, and 60 of which were in the balance of state. Um, so what I started doing, and I encouraged um, other members from the CAP agencies that were on the community planning team, was just get out there and start talking to people. Um, I began doing presentations. I went to every meeting that I could find. I contacted every VSO. Um, I worked very closely with the VA. Um, we have a very good relationship with the VA, so they were very helpful. And basically anyone who would listen, um, I was talking to them. Um, and each time that I talked to them, uh, in every presentation I did, I talked about the four C's. Um, compassion, cooperation, collaboration, and community action. Those are the four things that I think um, made the difference for us. Um, obviously, we all have to com have compassion to do the work that we do and work with the uh, population that we do. Uh, cooperation, we have to be willing to, and the ability to work with everybody in the community, the businesses, the landlords, churches, everybody. Break down all those little mini silos and just work for the same common goal. Collaboration, uh, making the time uh, and effort to work on the needs of the person, uh, the family, the community, and if we do that, we can reach that common goal. And then community action. Um, this is where we found our backbone, and once we started working together, we realized there was so much we had in common that we could work together and, and um, end homelessness in the balance of state of Nebraska. Next slide, please. This is just a map of the nine community action agencies um, to give you an idea of um, the breakout. Uh, my particular uh, agency is the one right in the center, the yellow one. The red one um, and the dark blue one towards the east, those are um, the Lincoln uh, COC and the uh, Omaha COC. Next slide, please. Could I get the next slide, please? Oh, 
oh, that's okay. <laughs> we skipped one, um, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, the, the slide I was going to show prior to that was just the SSVF coverage area for Nebraska. And um, I just wanted to point out, you know, oh, there it is. <laughs> um, the blue area is the, the area that um, my agency covers. And then um, the uh, uh, brown area there, starting October 1st is actually going to be covering um, the Omaha COC area, so the yellow as well, but we will still continue to be covered, so that's uh, very exciting for us. But with the hard work of our community planning team and our CAP agencies, um, the success of our uh, by name list, um, we were able to make our submission to USICH to declare ending veterans homelessness in the balance of state in Nebraska, and that was accepted on May 29th of this year, so that was very exciting for us. Uh, next slide, please. And obviously our, our work is uh, not even close to being over, um, so if there's anything in the future I can do to, to help others or um, any information I can give, please feel free to contact me and this is my information. Um, I'm still willing to talk to anybody who's willing to listen. <laughs> so thank you very much. Great, thank you, Kelly. And before I turn it over to Stuart, do you mind if I ask you a, a couple of questions? Sure. Um, so, so not only did you end veteran homelessness, you know, you met the definition of ending veteran uh, functional zero uh, mm -hmm. for veteran homelessness. You had a fairly big uh, decline in family homelessness that I could tell. I think it was about 35% over the course of a couple of years. Um, could you talk about um, largely how that occurred? Was you know what what shifts you made in your traditional way of doing business? Um, we actually, that would be um, our coordinated entry, really. Um, we had a team, it was called the um, MVR team, the Most Vulnerable Response Team, and it was very similar to the by name list, and all the um, PSH uh, literally homeless uh, individuals were put on this list, and that was the beginning of our coordinated entry. Um, our overall coordinated entry is actually starting this year, October 1st, but the MVRT team um, has been able to, uh, or has been running very successfully for the last few years, and that is uh, uh, really what made a big difference for us. They. Um, being able to show that collaboration and work within the, the state and the balance of state made a huge difference for us. Okay, good. And and the you know, often what we hear from people in urban areas is that the cost of housing is extraordinary. I know that that's also shared in rural areas, but often the complaint in rural areas is there is no housing stock. There's a shortage of housing stock. What tips or what solutions did you find in um, when, you know, frankly, there's not much housing stock? That is true. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's not so much that the housing is not a, there, it's just not uh, safe and suitable housing. Um, in the rural areas especially, they, they, you know, they just don't keep the housing um, up as much as they need to. Um, so they're not passing, um, you know, housing quality standards, they're not passing habitability standards. And so what um, I know in, uh, within our agency, what we did was we worked very closely with our weatherization department to um, assist landlords in getting these housing, uh, these houses back up to standard conditions from the substandard conditions that they weren't. Um, there, were, there were a couple of communities also that um, we worked with this, um, the, the town council or the village councils and they actually would provide incentives to landlords if they would, um, you know, fix their housing up and um, get it up to uh, standardized housing. Great. So were you using the weatherization um, plan as a little bit of an incentive too, or was it just to bring some, or and or just bring units online that otherwise HUD would have rejected as suitable? We did both, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. And one last question, then I'm going to turn to Stuart. Um, you mentioned that you're hooking your folks up into mainstream services, and I know that um, 
some services that families rely on, child care, uh, TANF benefits, employment supports, can be a little hard to come by and are not so easily accessible. Was there any change in, in how you were able to serve families with those programs, any kind of concessions, or were you able to bring those folks to the table in a different way? Um, yes, we were, actually. What we did was um, our grant writer, actually, um, found a uh, grant possibility, and she did apply for it, and it was, um, it's called SNAP Outreach, and it, it is a faction of, of DHHS, but what we do is we're able to get out to those folks and do the outreach and sign people up for benefits um, who have issues or trouble going through the normal um, chains of, you know, going online to, to apply for benefits and things like that. We received a grant so that we can actually go out there and help do that. And I know two of the other uh, CAP agencies were also able to get that grant as well. So we kind of, we work in partnership with Health and Human Services on that. That's great. All right. Well, thank you very much. I know that other folks are going to have lots of questions, but thanks for, you know, allowing me to jump in there. So if sure. I can now turn it over to my friend Stuart Campbell. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Hello, everybody. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I first want to say congratulations to Nebraska's Balance of State. Um, that's quite an achievement. Um, we have actually been talking about and exploring the possibility of attempting that here, and I certainly understand the uh, size of the challenge, so kudos to you guys. Um, well, uh, so I was asked to sort of give an overview of uh, what is happening in our state related to uh, homelessness. Um, and uh, like Kelly, I'm going to start off by giving you all sort of a snapshot of um, uh, some of the ways our state uh, is laid out, um, we have uh, 17 community action agencies. Uh, we have 16 continuums of care. We actually have 23 counties in the city of Baltimore. So uh, a lot of the COCs and the CAP agencies are single county, um, but there are a handful that are uh, uh, conglomerate of, of three or, or more counties. Uh, especially in the, the uh, eastern part of the state. Now, the majority of our CAP agencies already participate in some way or another with uh, with the COCs, and a lot of them are working on homelessness, and five of them are actually the lead collaborative applicants for the COC. So uh, I, we're already starting, I think, in a, in a pretty good um, position. Uh, I, um, I, I agree with Sharon that homelessness is the right role for many CAP agencies and, um, you know, with the, the federal mandate that uh, is unique to uh, CAP agencies of, of uh, alleviating poverty um, and especially with the uh, new changes in the uh, annual report, annual survey and, and uh, the module three stuff and, and the need for a system change, I think working with uh, homelessness is actually you know, uh, a, a, a way that, that CAP agencies can make a pretty significant impact, a positive impact on their community. So um, I'm a strong advocate of, of encouraging the CAPs to, to do that. Um, within the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, or DHCD, um, I, I'm actually fortunate in that I oversee both the Community Services Block Grant the emergency and the Emergency Solution Grants Program. We get um, uh, federal and state funds. Our state generously adds uh, a couple million dollars to the one million that we received from HUD. Um, we also have uh, several state programs that are um, related specifically to homelessness. And we receive um, about 9.4 million in state funds total and then additional 10.6 million in federal. But that includes both ESG and CSBG. So it's not, um, it's not all homelessness. It's, you know, the CSBG is a, is a sizable chunk. We are the state housing authority for Maryland. Um, although I'm not responsible for it, weatherization is part of uh, our agency. Uh, we also do the low-income housing tax credit properties, and um, we have been exploring ways to uh, increase the number of permanent supportive housing units that we can uh, help uh, finance. Um, we uh, also have uh, the Section 8, or Housing Choice Vouchers, for a lot of the rural areas. So 
so we, we have a lot of the pieces, um, which I'm really fortunate to have uh, within either my, directly my responsibility or at least in the building. Um, we're also doing a lot of outreach. Um, in fact, I have a meeting tomorrow morning with uh, an assistant secretary over at the Department of Labor to talk about improving our collaboration with them. So, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a priority for me to create those linkages on the state level that I think are so critical uh, to success. Some specific initiatives that we've been undertaking, um, we actually, uh, the, the, at, at our suggestion, the legislature in um, earlier this year uh, moved uh, multiple homeless programs that were at other state agencies over to THCD effective July 1. Um, this includes the Maryland Interagency Council on Homelessness, which is chaired by our secretary. Um, and he, the, uh, we're again fortunate that he's a very um, engaged and passionate uh, about this issue. Uh, so um, we have the support of our of our leadership um, to make things happen, which is really helpful. Uh, we uh, the the department Maryland Department of Health has some specific homelessness programs dealing with uh, specific populations, but effective July first. Uh, DHCD is the lead agency in Maryland for homelessness. And this allows for a lot more uh, coordination of homeless programs. Uh, it, um, it really is, um, you know, uh, helpful to have them all here. Uh, we are just sort of settling in with these programs. Uh, but we, over the next few months, we are going to be um, taking a close look at all of them, figuring out where there are duplications, redundancies, um, how we can streamline the application process, maybe condensing them into a single application, um, and, and quite frankly, updating some of the regulations. A lot of the regulations related to the state programs are very outdated. Um, they don't take into consideration housing first. Uh, they have some kind of quirky stipulations, and so this is really an opportunity for us to do some significant updating of, of the state's overall response. Uh, and another initiative we have that's, that's been something that I've been very interested in uh, from the beginning here is strengthening our relationships with the, the continuums of care. You know, they receive about $48 million directly from the federal government uh, compared to our, uh, you know, 10 or 20 million, um, they're, you know, they, they get the money, the big, uh, the big money from the Fed, so um, they don't have as much of an incentive uh, to work with us, although they have been, and uh, it's been a priority of mine to really improve our relationship, and, and um, we bring them together twice a year now and uh, share with, with them uh, um, what's happening on the national level, on the state level. Um, we actually uh, had uh, Norm Suchar come in, who's the head of the SNAPS office, in June to, to talk with them. Uh, so I, I think we've really been fortunate in, in improving our relationship uh, with the COCs. Um, so some of the specific efforts to increase the collaboration, um, we've uh, I've definitely been encouraging CAP agencies uh, and the CO3 the COCs to work more uh, closely together. Um, we do that through trainings. We do that at the annual uh, state association conference. We always have a uh, we always participate in homelessness track there um, to make sure the issue is is elevated. Um, I mentioned that we bring the two COCs together, uh, all the COCs together twice a year. Um, but another thing that has really made, I think, a difference is that when I started um, two, a little over two years ago here, uh, our ESG program had not really been as focused on, on the housing first side of things. Um, it just, what you know, it had been run by, by folks for many years, and, and so I came in and, and I really started uh, promoting an emphasis on housing first and prioritizing rapid rehousing, which is an eligible activity under ESG. Uh, and that I'm really excited uh, that we've effectively doubled um, the number of, uh, of uh, rapid rehousing applications that we receive through the ESG process. And I'm really hopeful and plan to try and expand that as we look at how we can uh, make some changes and update the the uh, programs that were just 
just received by the department. So we're, we're definitely going to be looking at increasing the uh, the, the rapid rehousing uh, there as well. So another initiative that is um, just starting is. Uh, of learning collaboratives that we've partnered with the University of Maryland School of Social Work and the National Alliance on Homelessness. The goal is to reduce the length of stay and increase exits to permanent housing. Uh, this is a, a learning collaborative that was patterned after a similar initiative in Virginia that ultimately made some pretty significant inroads in reducing family homelessness specifically, but homelessness overall. And we hope to have some similar outcomes here as well. What it's going to look like is there are going to be four regional trainings four times over the next year. So starting next week, in fact, we have one on Tuesday in the, the west, one on Thursday in the east. And then we've got the following week, one in central north Maryland, and then uh, the following Thursday, Central South Maryland. Uh, that That's going to be a general intro to rapid housing to give folks a foundation of the best practices, what, uh, what they need to know, and that one's actually open to everyone. But after that, in the next uh, three uh, sessions that we'll be calling everyone together, it's going to be uh, only the uh, 31 rapid housing uh, funded programs that we support. Uh, there, there'll be uh, participants. It's going to be the executive director. It's going to be the rapid rehousing program director and a representative from the frontline staff are all going to be participating. There's going to be monthly calls uh, or periodic calls and check-ins. Uh, so it's going to be much more than just coming in and talking to each other or learning. It's going to be uh, really working with your colleagues on identifying best practices um, and, and how to improve them. And so the emphasis is going to be on strengthening the policies and procedures for, the, um, for each of the programs and a real strong focus on data collection. We want to set a, a baseline. When we have uh, the final event um, next year, it will be uh, at the end of a 100-year, uh, excuse me, 100-year, 100-day challenge that we are going to be kicking off to rapidly rehouse as many households as possible. And then we'll be holding a statewide event to publicize the success and, um, you know, hopefully have some pretty significant numbers to report. So. So we're very excited about this partnership with the National Alliance. I think it's going to be really helpful uh, to our community uh, service providers and the community action agencies that receive rapid rehousing funds. When we started promoting rapid rehousing, we were asked to provide training, and this is uh, part of that um, commitment to do so. So uh, that is really a quick uh, overview. I, I tend to speak quickly, so I'm if I've missed anything, I'm more than happy to, to take questions. Uh, so, Sharon, back to you. Oops, sorry about that. I, I did a lot of talking on mute there for a second. So just a reminder for folks to submit questions um, via, via the question box. But Stuart, if you don't mind, I'm going to um, ask you a couple quick questions first. And that one is, uh, actually, one thing that I was really struck with by both presentations was the power of convening, you know, the, that you were bringing, there was people who have never been around the table together, bringing people around the table together and, and trying to get, I believe, a common vision about how we're going to be moving forward. Um, so if, could you tell me a little bit about who maybe be the non-traditional partners that you're bringing to the table, Stuart, or are you largely starting off with people who are sort of at the front line of homeless services and kicking it up a notch? Well, we're doing a little bit of both. I mean, obviously, it's going to be the, the front line of homeless services that are the primary folks. And, um, you know, we one of the nice things, I mean, we are the state agency, we do have funding, so people tend to show up when we ask them to. Uh, so we've been really fortunate in, in getting uh, a lot of the uh, senior level uh, folks from the COCs and the CAP agencies to come um, to our convenings. One of the things, though, that we have started to do, and it's not necessarily 
strictly related to homelessness, but it's definitely related to the CAP agencies, is we uh, have started bringing in other state agencies to talk about the, the ways that they can collaborate. I mentioned the Department of Labor. We had uh, someone in earlier this year. We've had folks come in and talk about weatherization. We've had folks come in and talk about LIHEAP and, and the, the Maryland program. So I think that's one of the things that we, we really can um, contribute is, is being able to, to get other state agencies into the door um, so that uh, and, and also federal agencies. We're right outside of Washington, D.C., so we're, we're fortunate in that respect, and we, we've invited uh, folks from HUD and HHS to come and, and present. And, and so that's really what our um, ability is, and I think is our, our strength is to be able to, to get people in, into the same room. Okay, great. And if I, I'm going to ask this question of, of both of you. Um, could you talk about, I think there's a lot of community action agencies that are not involved in delivering homeless services and and they the way that their resources are sort of, they're already obligated to other kinds of activities. Are there activities that are common among community action agencies that may not be reaching homeless services, so homeless people that could really benefit from them? You know, so, um, you know, what are some of the skills and resources and assets that they have that might be deployed on homelessness without actually having to move into doing housing stuff. I'll let Kelly take that one. <laughs> it was a wee bit of a softball, actually, so I, I could even start it. Uh, so just to get you, you know, I think that one of the earlier presentations that we had was with Salt Lake City, and and uh, and they weren't doing a lot of housing stuff. But they were doing Head Start, and they were making sure that, oh, one of the things that we could be doing is making sure that the children who are becoming homeless are connected to Head Start. Um, but I think a little bit about all the resources that community action agencies have at their disposal, the employment services and budget counseling and the weatherization that could be kind of leveraged by the homeless services. So even if you didn't have um, any additional dollars to bring to the table in addressing homelessness, if your plate's already full, um, actually just yeah. having some kind of Venn diagram over, mm -hmm. you know, so that you, you know, are syncing those up could be a benefit. Well, I, I do have two thoughts, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Kelly. Um, one, you mentioned weatherization, and we uh, we actually brought in the weatherization team and uh, and talked to them about uh, encouraging. Well, let me back up a sec. Partnering with the ESG providers who are doing rapid rehousing as a way to incentivize landlords to participate in the program, because we know with rapid rehousing getting landlords can be a big challenge. But what weatherization will do is it, you don't, the owner doesn't have to be low income, only the tenant does. So uh, the weatherization program, the, the ESG provider can say, hey, if you participate, we'll link you up with the weatherization program and they'll come in and upgrade your apartment. And so um, I, I haven't seen how that's playing out yet, but the result, we've got a lot of excitement uh, around that, um, so I think that's one one way is to just to look for for partnerships like that. And the, if a cap agency is actually doing the weatherization, they can reach out to uh, rapid housing providers and say, "Hey, this is a service," and they're not going. It won't expend you know cost them any more money um, to, to do that. The other thing is, I I think is is sort of a philosophical change. What we we have been doing, and this isn't specific to homelessness, but we've really been promoting the two-generation de two approach to dealing with uh, households. And I think you were talking about it when you, you know, when the child comes in and, and the house, the, they're in Head Start and linking them um, with homeless services and vice versa. That really is sort of the genesis of what the two-generation approach is, is looking at uh, the family holistically and the ways that um, you can help the entire family uh, with a, a wide range of, of services. So those are my two thoughts. Great. Kelly, any additional thoughts on that? Um, it's pretty much the same for us, um, actually. Um, and actually, all of our CAP agencies in Nebraska, um, well, when I, and I say Nebraska, I mean the balance of state of Nebraska, um, do offer uh, housing programs of some sort. So. 
um, it's just a matter of uh, linking all the resources together. And as I mentioned earlier, and, and Stuart just mentioned, the weatherization is a huge one, um, at least for my agency. Um, we partner with them a lot. Uh, we have Section 8 joint housing within my agency, and um, that makes a world of difference for us. Uh, we basically share landlords um, if, you know, our housing department, um, Section 8 department, you know, has a landlord that, that they can't fill somebody, they let us know so that we can get somebody in there. So, I mean, we, we work very, very closely together with them. So, Kelly, can I ask, when you started to do, when you started to bring everybody together so that, you know, you were working on a common direction, did that um, change how you did services? Were there any shifts in how you did, for example, homelessness prevention or how you used your housing programs? Um, not really. Um, well, I guess actually that's not true. <laughs> we we did have to, um, we looked at housing uh, prevention a lot more than, um, you know, rapid rehousing because, as I mentioned earlier, the, the homelessness looked a lot different in some of those more remote rural areas. And, you know, because of the weather that I mentioned and things like that, rapid rehousing, um, literally homeless, just was not there. It, they were homeless prevention. Even in those small communities, you know, they're not going to let a veteran sleep outside. They're just not going to. Yeah. And so we had to look more at homeless prevention than our rapid rehousing when we first took over. Okay. Great. Well, you know, we don't have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm, you know, I'm just going to wrap it up shortly and move to my slides, but just one last for you both related to your presentation. So for community action agencies that are not involved currently in the continuum of care and have sort of been, you know, sidelined or felt sidelined or, you know, have their own priorities. Are, any, are there any initial, like, first steps you might suggest? Um, well, actually, all, all of ours are involved. <laughs> so, yeah. so um, you know, I guess I, I consider myself lucky um, that we can bring all of our uh, CAP agencies to the table for sure. Good. Yeah, and, and okay. the same for us. We have, you know, most of ours, if not all, are, are doing some work in, in the housing and homelessness arena. But I think if if there are CAP agencies who aren't um, doing it, I think getting the state association or the state uh, lead CSBG uh, agency on board with this effort could make a, a huge difference. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we were talking before the webinar about how we can kind of help we can encourage this across the country. I think getting the, the national, the federal folks together um, would be uh, a good idea too. You know, uh, the, the OCS, the Office of Community Services, speaks at both the Community Action Partnership Conference and at the, the NASCASP conference, which is the state agencies. Um, and I, I would love to see them talk about uh, working more on, on homelessness issues and maybe bring HUD into those conferences as well. So, you know, just start talking up the chain, talking to people in, in leadership in the state and in the federal to um, get, start getting them encouraging the, this collaboration. Okay, thank you, Stuart. So I have, uh, just to kind of update, I like to close all of these webinars with uh, saying that our, um, our ability to meet the needs of people experiencing homelessness uh, depends on our federal partners, uh, our Congress, providing the resources that we need to end homelessness. And so for us, uh, I think we, it looks like we're okay. Medicaid was a big question mark this this past few months, this past year, uh, as you all know. Um, much of the way that permanent supportive housing is provided to chronically homeless people is funded with some resources and some supports that are provided by Medicaid. And so having that revenue to make sure that supportive services services are there for people with the greatest disabilities is critical to permanent support of housing success. So just kind of staying alert on that, um, we're asking you to be our partners in letting people know um, 
what resources are needed to end homelessness. Currently, sort of on our front line of things to be on the lookout for is McKinney Vent of Homeless Assistance Programs. We have uh, information up on our website at www.endhomelessness.org that would allow you to kind of just click through, immediately get linked with your uh, congressional representatives, your senators, and all you would need to say is that um, you, we need to provide maximum funding for to end homelessness, and ending homelessness is important in our state because, um, and I won't go into the, the non-defense discretionary caps here, um, that's a little bit of a budget priority kind of issue. Um, the caps have to be sort of, uh, the caps have to be exp released in order to increase the budget. Essentially, the, the pie is a little too small, as it were, but I think the priority here is Medicaid and McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Program. So could you go to the next slide, and this is the last slide, and I'm going to ask this of my friends first. So over the last two years, the National Alliance on Homelessness and the Community Action Partnership, as you've heard, has been taking a look at, um, you know, successful partnerships locally, the research, the best practices, the common practices, and, and ways in which community action programs and, um, and continuum of care or homeless service providers could be working together uh, to solve homelessness. So as we look forward to what we want to do in the coming years, I, you know, I, personally, I think both the Alliance and the Community Action Partnership thinks that there's fantastic potential in leveraging both uh, skill sets and both resources and making sure that we're working in an aligned way at the state level. Is there, are there resources or tools or information that we can be providing at the national level um, that we haven't been providing? Is there something that we would be, able, we could be able to provide to you that would enable you to make this happen in your community? Uh, so that's a question I have um, for everyone who's listening, and I think we'll pose it through the Community Action Partnerships newsletter, perhaps, to solicit some ideas of things that would be helpful. Um, I don't know, Kelly or Stuart, if you want to add anything here? Well, I, I guess I sort of jumped the gun a little bit in, in what I yeah. said a few minutes ago, but uh, I, I think being a, a federal presence that the National Alliance has, you would be really instrumental in getting the, the, uh, the federal partners to really increasing the visibility of this issue, uh, getting OCS to to um, you know address it specifically as a priority uh, would be would be I think go a long way. Uh, I don't know if that is possible. There's a lot of competing priorities, but that would certainly be helpful. Kelly, any thoughts? Um, pretty much, I would have to agree, um, and maybe just even some education for them because um, I actually get a lot of questions um, from the upper echelon that, that don't seem to understand um, why we're working towards what we're working for. Um, for example, when we first um, received our, our submission um, clarification, we went to um, make the, the statement and there was actually people in um, the state level that did not know anything about ending homelessness <laughs> that really should have, and so I think some education to them would be very helpful. Yeah, hey, Kelly, I think, you, I think you're just, go ahead, I'm sorry. I, um, no, what you, I was gonna no, say is, ahead, I, I, yeah, I, I agree uh, completely, and I think the education on the local level is actually just as important because I'm sure, especially in rural communities, all of us have heard one elected official or another say something like, there are no homeless in my community, uh, oh, when yeah. we all know that that's actually not the case. Uh, so, you know, reaching out to the local electeds, uh, and, you know, that is a, I, you know, that is a huge role for the CAP agencies. There's, you know, that's why they have a tripartite board and have uh, elected officials on their board. They're supposed to be connected. Um, so that would be a really terrific uh, role for the CAP agencies 
to play is to really increase the visibility of homeless issues uh, within their own community. Oh, yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Hyacinth, and anything you would like to add to this one? I think Pretty I have the spot. words right out of my mouth, actually. <laughs> um, both of your suggestions, I think, are really in line with what we're seeing here as a partnership in terms of what we're hearing um, people saying that they're doing on the ground, but also what we've learned about a little bit in this learning community group. So, <laughs> no, I think, I think you guys are spot on. Okay, well, I just want to let you know that the National Alliance on Homelessness and the Community Action Partnership is, is a, I, they don't know it yet, but they're going to, uh, we're going to meet, we're going to have a, a little bit of a conversation and think about what could we be doing together to really bring this up, to really elevate it. We've done the webinars, but is there something a little bit more that um, increases the oomph or gets you the tools that you need to make this happen locally um, and, uh, and what those tools would be, and, and so we've got some suggestions from Kelly and Stuart, and so those are a, a, among the things that we're going to look at. I really hope that people will take some time. If you go to the next slide, um, you will see my email address, but it's pretty easy. You could just find me at, at the National Alliance and Homelessness website. Don't be shy. Just say, this is, this is why we're not involved, or, or this is why we don't think it's important, or here's what would really help us get more involved. Things that you think would be helpful, concrete steps that we can be doing. Um, but in the meanwhile, one of the most important things that we believe the, the Alliance um, um, uh, is helping us move forward in ending homelessness is communities like, you know, Nebraska Balance of State that shows us that it can be done, that we can see that veteran homelessness reaches, you know, it reaches functional zero, that it's a one-third decline in uh, family homelessness, that the state leaders in Maryland are going to deploy multiple kinds of funding streams and bring diverse people around the table to create one common vision and learn from one another. So we're very grateful for all the steps that people are taking at the local level uh, uh, to achieve this goal that we all believe in. And I really thank uh, the Community Action Partnership for hosting us and for uh, a great two-year working relationship. So thank you all very much. And again, don't be shy if you have other things you think we should be looking at and doing. Thank you so much, Sharon. And uh, thank you once again to today's presenters, uh, Stuart and Kelly. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to share your experience and your thoughts with us on what you guys are doing um, at the local and state levels to um, combat homelessness. So that's really exciting stuff. Thank you very much. So um, to wrap up for today's webinar presentation, we have just a couple of concluding thoughts on behalf of the partnership. Um, as Sharon mentioned, uh, we really do um, appreciate the time that we've been able to spend together and to hear from you all out in the field um, what your experiences are through this learning community group. Um, it's been such an exciting experience. Um, and a key way that you can uh, help feed this effort is to provide your feedback on these webinar events that we give um, to give us any ideas on um, additional topics that would be helpful or even if you would be interested in talking about something that's going on in your state, we would love to host you. Um, but you can do so by just taking a few moments of your time to fill out the survey. You can uh, copy the link here on your screen and open it up in your browser and just let us know uh, how we did, if there are other topics you would like to hear about, and um, anything else relating to our webinar event. So uh, we do encourage you to do that. Um, here you have the contact information for all of the TT staff. Please feel free to reach out to any of us with any of your questions, concerns, comments ideas um, and we'll do our best to help you uh, get sorted out and to give you an answer to your question. Um, but with that, that will actually conclude today's webinar presentation. Uh, thank you once again to Sharon and the National Alliance and of course to our presenters. Um, have a great day. Thank you.